Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tom Farr, president of the Religious Freedom Institute. Welcome to our conference on exploring declarations that promote human dignity and religious freedom for all people. We're going to take a close look, as you know, if you've looked at your program, at seven such declarations written by people from different religions, different cultures, and geographic locations around the world. I'm not aware that this kind of conference has been done before. Of course, I don't know everything, but I'm not aware. <laughs> of course, each of these declarations has generated attention on its own merits, and justifiably so, but I believe this is the first attempt to examine a core group of declarations under the twin banners of human dignity and religious freedom. This conference is one of the first side events for the second annual U.S. Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom, which will be con convened tomorrow by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and run by Ambassador at Large for Religious Freedom Sam Brownback, whom you will hear for, from uh, shortly. The goal of the Ministerial is to build an international movement to advance religious freedom among governments, civil society organizations, and publics at large, societies, if you like. We think this conference is a good way to kick off this week, both in terms of the substance and the timeliness of this subject. Now, my reason for saying that is straightforward, although unfortunately it's controversial here in the United States and around the world. It's the proposition that religious freedom is grounded in the dignity of the human person. If a human being lacks religious freedom, he or she cannot live a fully human life. Well, if everyone agreed with that proposition, we wouldn't have a need for a ministerial or for universal declarations, but we do. So in that context, I want to commend Secretary Mike Pompeo for establishing a new State Department <coughs> Advisory Commission on Unalienable Rights, also called Inalienable Rights. That's probably the way that you've heard it expressed, but it's the same thing. These are rights that are natural to and constitutive of the human person. They're not, these rights are not instituted by governments, but are created by, if we can put it this way, a greater than human source of such rights. The American founders believed that the right of religious freedom was not the only such right, that is to say a fundamental and inalienable right, but they believed that it was the first of such rights, the building block for the other fundamental rights, pre precisely because it is the right that is at the very heart of human dignity. They believed it is a natural and inalienable right because it's given by God, not by governments, and must be protected by any government which claims to be just. Before I introduce my colleague, Cole Durham, I want to say a word about the Religious Freedom Institute and how it approaches this issue, this issue of human dignity and religious freedom and the connections between them. <clears throat> The Religious Freedom Institute, the RFI, is an outgrowth of a decade of work at Georgetown University where we conducted research all over the world on this issue, on the meaning of religious freedom and its value to everyone. One of our conclusions has been that the American founders were right. Ten years, empirical research, they were right. Religious freedom is necessary to human dignity and human flourishing. And precisely because of this deep anthropological reality, the empirical evidence shows that religious freedom helps produce practical human and social goods, such as greater economic growth, political stability, social harmony, and less religion-related violence and religion-related terrorism. Today, the Religious Freedom Institute 
continues the research through its affiliated scholars, but now it also puts the scholarship on the ground, if it, as it were, in particular societies and regions around the world. We make arguments about the meaning and value of religious freedom that are tailored <coughs> to the audience that we are engaging. We have action teams in South and Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and North America. We have an action team on international religious freedom policy, which sponsored the event just prior to this one, and one on Islam and religious freedom. But most relevant for today's conference is our new Center for Religious Freedom Education, headed by David Trimble. David will be describing one of our signal achievements at RFI called the American Charter for Freedom of Religion and Conscience. It's a contemporary restatement of the founders' understanding of religious freedom, updated and endorsed by a wide array of contemporary American leaders from across the political and religious spectrum. When's the last time you heard that? Do you remember? From across the political and religious spectrum, people came together to endorse the American Charter of Freedom of Religion and Conscience, not because all these people agree on a lot of stuff, including things having to do with religious freedom, but because they are convinced it's necessary for the flourishing of our society along with others. And I hope that you will agree that it is one of the signal declarations that we're going to be uh, examining today. It's one of the seven. So let me turn the podium over to my friend and colleague, Professor Cole Durham. Cole is the founding director of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies and Susa Young Gates University Professor at Law, both at Brigham Young University. Uh, the center, or ICLARS, which is its acronym, and it's nice. I've always wanted to say this to you, Cole, but how you came up with a an acronym that you could actually make a, a word out of. And, you know, this is very important for acronyms. If you can't make a, a verb out of it, then you're in trouble. So I clars that thing. The center is our co-host for this event. event. Indeed, it was their idea. And it was a good one to bring these declarations together and examine them and plumb them for these fundamental ideas of uh, inalienable rights, of religious freedom and of human dignity. So in the field of law and religion, no one has been more influ influential than the man you're going to hear now. So uh, please welcome my friend and colleague, Professor Cole Durham. Well, I, I, I appreciate the uh, credit for our acronym. I have to tell you that there are actually two related acronyms. Uh, we are located in Utah, and it's just ICLRS, so we call it ICLEARS. And there's another one in Italy, founded by Silvio Ferrari, who many of you know, which is ICLARS, the International Consortium for Law and Religion Studies. Uh, but <coughs> it, the linkage between the acronyms also reflects a kind of linkage of many people in the f field. and. As I look around here, I recognize many familiar faces uh, because <coughs> this is a field in which there have been many common efforts over, over time. Uh, let, let me say uh, uh, just first a word about the need and then uh, some things about what we've been doing and then what we might hope to learn as we uh, sit and uh, talk with each other today. Uh, so first, uh, the need. Uh, it's about 20 years ago, I guess tw a little over 20 years ago now, that the International Religious Freedom Act was passed in the United States. Uh, I see people nodding heads. Many of you were there and involved. Uh, uh, I, I was there on the day that the bill passed the Senate uh, unanimously, as I recall, 98 votes, two people weren't there. Um, and what was striking to me about this, because I, I, 
and on the one hand, I had been involved in the background. I knew the the gang of four who worked on it behind the scenes, the staffers, uh, et cetera, because originally this bill had been somewhat controversial because it started out as something that would focus on Christian persecution and due to the work of a lot of committed uh, people was broadened out to make sure that it was something that was about religious freedom for all. Uh, now, what what is memorable about the date that the bill was passed is not the consensus date of the passage of a bill on religious freedom. What is remarkable is that that was also the day that the impeachment of Bill Clinton went forward in the House. That means that on one of the most highly polarized days in American history, there was consensus on religious freedom for all. And I was doing a lot of work in Eastern Europe at the time. Uh, one of the things I realized is that this ideal of religious freedom and the related ideal of dignity is something that is deeply embedded in American culture, indeed in profound ways national identity in this country is not linked to any particular religion or ethnos. It is li linked in profound ways to religious liberty, what John, well, what Madison called the luster of our country, great book titled by John Noonan as well. Now, in the years since, uh, this has become more controversial uh, religious freedom has been embedded in the culture wars, and in part because of that, uh, there is deep suspicion about religious freedom. There is suspicion that it is somehow a cloak for political uh, incentives coming from the right, uh, that it's motivated by uh, one-sided kinds of views. And I think just as those, I'll call them the Gang of Four, uh, don't, I'm not sure if any of them are here, they might be, uh, but, the, but the much broader movement in American culture to make sure that this idea was understood not as something that is one-sided and for any particular religion or uh, faith orientation, but it's for everyone. Uh, this is something that is really fundamental. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the, the problem have occurred not only in American culture, but global culture. There have always been questions about whether behind the International Religious Freedom Act, for example, was a kind of neo-colonialist uh, thrust. Uh, <clears throat> I think those of us who have worked in the field uh, and who have known people really sincerely work in the field would say that commitment to this as a universal ideal, as something that is important for all human beings, uh, religious liberty and dignity, uh, uh, that's, that's the case for all of us. <clears throat> well, uh, the, pr the problem then is how do we continue to communicate this? Uh, it's an issue for every generation. One of the profound problems in the field of religious liberty, I often say, is that like crime in general, much of the uh, <coughs> problem, not all, but much of the problems, much of the incidents come from young men between age 15 and 25. It's what criminologists know as the sort of the period when most criminal activity occurs. And the problem that means for a, something like religious freedom is that every few years you've got a new generation that is, that is uh, dealing with these issues. So uh, at our institution for the past uh, 30 years, uh, 20 years formally, 10 years informally, we have been working on issues of religious freedom worldwide. We hold conferences at this point, uh, trying to reach the leader, leading people dealing with religious freedom in every country. Uh, 
Uh, we hold m many conferences around the world, and the, the strategy has been to reach sort of the key policy makers. But I, I think uh, as we've wrestled with these issues and recognized that uh, there are broader issues about reaching these issues in culture at large, we need to find ways to reach out more broadly. Now, it, it's in this sense that we started thinking, I know, about how do you go back to the underlying sort of universal concepts. We've spent a lot of time over the past a couple of years thinking about dignity, thinking about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that's, uh, we're in the, the uh, 80th, 70th, 70th year, starting the 80th decade, the 80th, well anyway, <laughs> you get the point. Math is, I'm in this field because math was not my strong suit. Uh, but, uh, <coughs> But the point, the point is that uh, to really uh, understand these issues, there's a constant need to understand them more deeply, uh, to understand them and be able to articulate them in ways that will connect with the current generation, with the current uh, time situation. And I think that's one of the reasons that we wanted to bring people together to talk about these great declarations that have come fr uh, from many different parts of the world uh, to try and ask ourselves, are there common things that we should be learning from these uh, collective declarations? Are there paths forward that they help identify? Are there things that need to be done to make them more effective so that they are not just rhetoric on parchment or other forms of paper or these days on websites, but something that will really connect with people and connect with not just with the experts but with the broader culture. Uh, because uh, our world, our society depends in deep ways on the kinds of freedom and the respect for dignity and the recognition that different people are going to understand this in different ways and, and how despite these differences we can live together in peace and understanding and mutual respect these are challenges these are challenges that we that these declarations that we're going to be talking about recognize in different ways uh, but are there ways that we can make them more effective make them more meaningful. We're grateful to be able to be uh, partnered in this uh, event today with, the, uh, with Tom Farr's Institute. We've worked so many times with Tom and uh, the, the successive uh, roles that he has had and the institutions that he has helped create. Uh, no one has been a more effective uh, advocate for uh, religious freedom at, at national policy here and internationally. So we're grateful to be working with them and with all of you, and I hope that as we go through these days, this will be a, an excellent start for a very meaningful week with the ministerial. So with that, let me stop, and we'll t turn time back to Tom. Thank you, Cole. It's now my privilege. He is, the ambassador is here, right? I'm going to introduce him. <laughs> you would be right here. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce the man who heads the U.S. policy of advancing international religious freedom, Ambassador Sam Brownback. I won't detail his extraordinary resume except to say that he was among those that Cole was talking about a few minutes ago. He was a U.S. Senator from Kansas when the International Religious Freedom Act passed in 1998 and was one of its most vocal champions. There's a simple reason for that. Sam Brownback lives and breathes religious freedom. It's in his DNA. As you're going to see, he talks about it with passion and eloquence. But the thing that is most impressive about Ambassador Brownback is that he does more than talk. He acts. One of his first acts when he began the job last year was to convince the Secretary of State to do something that had never been done before, namely to conduct a ministerial, a gathering of foreign ministers and foreign delegations in Washington 
on the subject of religious freedom. Not only had it never been done, it was risky. But with the support of his outstanding colleagues in the Office of International Religious Freedom, including Knox Thames, who you'll hear from later today, and Dan Nadell, who is my successor times several as the director of the office, Ambassador Brownback brought it off, and it was a resounding success. So here we are, a year later, kicking off the second annual Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom, a gathering over, of over 100 foreign delegations and hundreds of heads of NGOs and civil society and religious communities, heads of religious communities. This is proof positive that Ambassador Brownback and his office are not just issuing reports and making speeches, which they are doing, and they're excellent, but he and they are working to convince foreign governments that moving toward religious freedom is not only the right thing to do, it's in their fundamental national interest to do. For example, religious freedom, as I've already mentioned, will contribute to economic development, undermining terrorism, and the rest. I believe he's making a profound contribution to the fight against uh, mounting international religious persecution and the cause of advancing the precious right of religious freedom for everyone. Let me emphasize that final point. America stands for the religious freedom of everyone, everywhere. Ambassador Brownback has delivered that message personally, for example, in the refugee camps where Rohingya Muslims had fled after savage persecution in Burma, in China where he has fiercely condemned China's war on faith against Muslims, Tibetan Buddhists, and Christians. He's delivered the powerful message that in America where we stand with the persecuted of every creed and of every nation. We won't remain spectators in the face of the mounting global assault on human dignity, whether by mobs, terrorists, or governments. We'll speak, and we will act. Mr. Ambassador, we're grateful for your service to our country and to the millions around the world who are suffering religious persecution. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambassador Sam Brown. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate that. David, good to see you. So how many of you are, hey, Jan, welcome to America. Man, good to have you back. Good to have you here. We're kind of hot today, uh, but how many of you got five or more religious freedom events uh, on the dance card this week? Uh, there are the sidebar events. How many, uh, Nathan, how many are? 81 sidebar events going on uh, in addition to the main stage event at State Department. And then there's a second stage at George Washington University if you haven't had enough. Uh, and, when, and then everybody meets at the Hive afterwards if you're younger. Nathan wants that and I'm going, really? I, I'm over 60. I'm not going to any place after any later. I'm going to try to save energy for the next day. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, this is a, I'm just ecstatic. I woke up at four this morning like a kid before Christmas, uh, and I know that's a Christian example, so I, I'm not being very politically or religiously sensitive, but, you know, just come on, can we open the presents? Because we're going to have one of the few events in Washington uh, that will have both headlining both by Vice President Pence and Speaker Pelosi. Uh, will headline the uh, the ministerial. We'll uh, be speaking at it, and in this divided town, that's just not happening very often. But that does show you the power and the 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 nature of this topic. It is one that people are saying, "No, we've got to do something." And you're going to have people of every faith or no faith at all here uh, participating and pushing for each other's religious freedom, which is what we've got to have. We've got to have a grassroots movement of all faiths coming together and saying, we're not talking about a common theology. We're not going to discuss theology. We're talking about a common human right. This is a common human right. It's a right I have. It's a right you have. It's a right everybody in this room has everywhere, all the time, wherever they are. And, and that's what we've got to push for. And if we can get really the faith, civil society pushing together, then day three of the governments becomes much easier. Because then we're pushing the governments, all of us together, to say, no, you gotta, you got to stand for the religious freedom. I mean, you got to protect your religious minorities. We kicked off uh, today at the Holocaust Museum as just a stark, stark, stark physical reminder of what happens when a religious minority uh, is a attacked by a government and a society's not responding, the world community doesn't respond, and millions get killed. 
And we wish all of that was just in the past and never going to happen again, and you know, we, it's, it's just not going to happen, when we also had there 25 people who've been persecuted for their faith, that each will be telling a story, uh, and they'll be up and, and be there testifying about what's happening in the Rohingya refugee camps, what's happening to the Uyghurs in China. I spoke with a gentleman that was at the Christchurch uh, shootings in the uh, mosque that took place. There's a lady here from Sri Lanka and the Easter bombings that happened there. We'll have a, a Pittsburgh rabbi uh, that was, his synagogue was attacked. So this is, these are just not things in the past, which is a very unfortunate thing. The good thing for us is we're at a moment and we're at a gathering that we can make this different. We can move it different, and we've got to believe we can. That's, that's to me, half the battle, honestly, in a, in a political sense, is believing you can. Most people kind of go, it's just been going on for so long. Are we ever going to change the world this way? And so you start just going, I don't know. But that, that's what we can't do. What you, what you have to do is just say, no, we can change this, and indeed we have to change it. If the world's going to move forward, this has to change. We can't let, keep letting people get killed all over the place because they're simply of a different faith. Religious passions are easy to stir. And so that's why I think you find a lot of times they, these are kind of often the first places that, that people that, all right, I believe in my cause, but that I, I'm just... I, I'm willing to kind of go at any route possible to get it there, they will stir into religious passions. Uh, and so they're just, they're ones that people will go to pretty quickly uh, and often deadly. I was with a, a pastor from Nigeria this morning. He's not even speaking at the conference. His face is marred. He was shot in the face by Boko Haram uh, who were going after killing Christians in northern Nigeria. And he was one of the few that survived out of his church, the whole place. He's not even speaking here, but he's, he's drawn into it because he really wants to fight for this fundamental right. I am delighted to see um, uh, these statements coming together. Uh, and you've got some wonderful experts that are here, some of which I see in the room. One of which is uh, my predecessor, although I don't know if uh, Rabbi Saperstein is speaking here. I know you're speaking at a bunch of other places, but David was in this position before me and does a great job. Uh, but I think these statements, what I see in them are just this, this sort of passion, this sort of drive by humanity to say, we've got to get this right. And so we're, we're trying to reach out and make a statement that, no, don't kill people for their faith, and we stand for each other's faith. Uh, and so they, they know that there's something good here to be able to stand for each other's religious freedom. But on the other hand, then people pull back and say, yes, I know that's good, but do people have then the political courage to do it? Okay, I know that, and I had a guy tell me this one time, that most people know the right thing to do. It's whether they have the courage or uh, it really the, 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 the pain tolerance to do it. Uh, and that's most of what politics is about. Most people know the right thing to do, but do, do they have enough pain tolerance to do it? Because they know, okay, I'm going to stand up for people's religious freedom. And there are going to be a few people happy about this, religious minorities in particular. The religious majority, there are probably going to be people there that are going to be pretty upset about it and don't want to do it. And am I willing to tolerate, take the pain that it's going to take politically to do this? And what these statements are to me is people saying, yes, do it. Yes, this is the right thing to do. Yes, we'll back you. And the broader community has to do it. The majority faith community in these countries has to do it. That's what's so important about the majority faith. And every faith is majority someplace, the minority someplace else. But in their country where they're a majority, they have to stand up for the other minorities and then push that message around the world and say to their other faith adherents, hey, we're standing up for you in places where we're in the majority. You need to help us. So I, I think these are great that they're coming forward. Uh, I, just, I, I hope we can continue to build the momentum. And just a, a final point on this, as I started off on a thought uh, about this being a bipartisan from left and right, that's the way you get things done. Uh, I know in doing the human trafficking bill uh, years ago in the Senate, we had in our coalition at that time Chuck Colson uh, and Gloria Steinem in the same coalition. 
Uh, and a lot of my colleagues, when uh, Paul Wellstone and I were the two, that was the other odd couple of the, uh, of the thing, were the, we were the lead proponents in the Senate of it. And so when our colleagues would see us show up, they wouldn't even ask about the bill. They would just oh, sign me up. If you guys can agree on that, I'm easy. I, you know, go ahead and do it. Or if you've got Chuck Colson and Gloria Steinem on it, I'm, and this must be sliced bread. This is as good as it gets, and I will sign. And did, and we passed. In this sort of thing, we need these odd coalitions coming together so that the majority faith and the minority faiths come together and say, you know, okay, we're standing together. And that when the politicians see you coming, they're going, hmm, you guys don't agree on much of anything. So I'm going to be supportive of this because I, if you guys can agree, I'm, I'm easy on that. We need to build these sort of unusual coalitions. This is the space to do it, and this is the topic to do it on. This is one where it can be done, and it will be a blessing to the entire world, to everybody. Uh, thank you all, uh, everybody, for being here. I hope you enjoy the week. Please be patient with us if you wait in lines at uh, places or some things don't go as smoothly as they should. State Department's not used to holding a lot of people and inviting a lot of people, and we're maxed out. Uh, at it, but it's a great cause, and then we really, really, really hope you leave here pushing, uh, pushing on this at a grassroots level. Appreciate uh, RFI. Tom Farr's uh, been one of the hands at this for many years and has been very, very good at it, and we deeply appreciate uh, RFI and all of your work that you're doing here. God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. It's now my privilege to introduce someone whose life and work I've admired for many years, and I dare say there are others in the room who share that sentiment. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is an American-born convert to Islam. In 1996, he co-founded what became Zaytuna College, the first accredited Muslim liberal arts college in the United States. During the past several decades, he has served in a wide variety of highly important and influential positions, including advisor to the Center for Islamic Studies at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California, and as vice president for the Forum for Promoting Peace, headed by the eminent jurist Sheikh Abdallah bin Baya. Sheikh Hamza's scholarship on classical learning in Islam is deep capacious, and highly influential among Muslims and among students of Islam in the West and around the world. He is fluent in Arabic and an expert in Islamic rhetoric, poetry, law, and theology. He has studied in England, Spain, Morocco, Algeria, Mauritania, and the United Arab Emirates. He's a signatory of two of the declarations we're talking about today, a common word between us and you, and a major contributor to the Marrakesh Declaration, uh, which we, as I say, are going to be discussing in today's conference. A variety of publications, including those by experts on Islamic scholarship, such as Georgetown's John Esposito, have called Hamza Youssef the most influential Islamic intellectual in the West. You're now going to see why. Please welcome to the podium a man I'm privileged to call my friend, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. No First of all, thank you, Tom, for inviting me, uh, Governor Brownback, and uh, distinguished guests. I, I literally flew 21 hours to get here. So if I fall asleep while I'm talking, it's understandable. I came from Malaysia, and uh, I, I learned a lesson in Malaysia about the impact that a, uh, a leader of government can have on the people because they have a 94-year-old prime minister. And um, apparently he was recently interviewed, and there was vitamin C on the desk. And so vitamin C sold out all through Malaysia. 
because people were convinced that must be the secret <laughs> to his ability to be functioning at that level at 94. So anyway, um, the common word is, it has a very interesting story, but it also has a backstory that's probably even more interesting. It came out of the Regensburg speech that happened on September 12, 2006, where Pope Benedict the 16th gave a talk on faith, reason, and the university, memories and reflections. And in that speech, the Pope uh, quoted a Byzantine emperor, Emmanuel II. Um, and in that, among the quotes was, show me what Muhammad has brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhumane such as his command to spread by the sword the faith that he preached. So if, if you look at the original speech, the Pope prefaced these remarks by saying, Manuel addresses his interlocutor with a startling brusqueness, a brusqueness that we find unacceptable. The media left that part out and simply put out this thing, which caused an immense uh, uproar in the Muslim world. So I think all of us are familiar with the media's ability to do these things, which reminds me uh, of a quote by Kierkegaard that the, and I apologize to any press people given that we're in the press club. The daily press is the evil principle of the modern world. This was 200 years ago, so. <laughs> and time will only serve to disclose this fact with greater and greater clearness. The capacity for the newspaper for degeneration is sophistically without limit. Since it, since it can always sink lower and lower in the choice of its readers, at last it will stir up all those dregs of humanity which no state or government can control. And I think we've seen, uh, you know, Kierkegaard was, was somebody who uh, talked a lot about creeping villainy. Uh, and he said that the problem with creeping villainy is people can't really see it because they have neither the dialectical ability nor the imagination to see where things are headed at those early stages. So it's always important to listen to those people that have that ability to see things down the road. So because of this speech, it led to the ambassador of Morocco actually withdrawing from the Vatican. Um, it led to several statements from uh, people all over the Muslim world that were outraged by these statements. Again, unfortunately, people did not read the speech. The speech was actually about faith and reason. And although I think most Muslims of a normative tradition, and by that I mean a kind of orthodox understanding of the Islamic tradition and not looking at the outliers, extremists and others, uh, would argue that still the speech had problems because it was arguing that faith and reason were absent uh, in Islam because of a certain theological perspective. But the, but the speech was really a, a theological musing that turned into a political event, which is unfortunate. But from that, God brings good out of uh, bad sometimes. Um, from that came a response. There was an initial response a month afterwards of an open letter to the Pope uh, by Amir Ghazi bin Muhammad, who asked me to speak on his behalf here today. Amir Ghazi uh, sent this letter, and there, there wasn't much of a response. There, there, there was a, a, a personal response, but not much of a response. But a year later, he issued the common word. I was one of the editors on there and one of the original uh, people that signed on. But and, and just for editorial note, I did not want between us and you. I just wanted a common word between us. But uh, he chose to take the Quranic idiom, which says, Bainana wa um, Arabic's different from English. In fact, in, in Arabic, you know, we say uh, you and I, out of a kind of uh, decorum. Uh, in Arabic, you say I and you. So these are idi idioms that differ in languages. But the common word was, I think an attempt at putting an olive branch out to the Christian community, given that there was a lot happening in the Muslim world uh, that was affecting the Christian communities. And so, and a lot of tragic events were happening. The common word was initially really not responded to by the Vatican. There was uh, a letter from uh, Cardinal Turan, who's recently passed on, 
Um, but Torana actually uh, expressed skepticism about dialogue between uh, Muslims and Christians um, for some interesting uh, reasons that people can look at that if they like. But when uh, Miroslav Wolf and another uh, person at Yale at the Center for Faith and Culture responded with 300 Christians signing on from some of the most prominent uh, Christian leadership, this had a really interesting impact because then the Vatican responded. This is the backstory. The Vatican responded because of the Protestant response to this letter. And this led to the Muslim Catholic Forum. So we actually had a, a meeting. We all uh, went to the Vatican, the original people that signed on, and met with uh, Pope Benedict. And it was actually a very fruitful event. And out of that came this Muslim Catholic Forum, which now meets every four years to discuss things um, and, and look at ways that we do uh, can work together. And I think within the Catholic community, there are people that do want to work with uh, Muslims, understanding that we as faith-based communities faith, uh, face very common uh, problems uh, in, in our community. So Miroslav Wolf uh, went on, he, he actually wrote a book, Is, is, is Allah God?, uh, which is addressing some of the fundamental theological differences. Another person that responded was the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, who penned, in some ways, the most trenchant response to the common word, uh, which was called a common word for the common good. In that document, he argues that while the ways of understanding the divine are different, Christianity and Islam are not mutually unintelligible, and they speak enough of a common language to address concerns of humanity together. He identifies five ways that Muslims and Christians can dialogue and cooperate. Love and praise of God, love of neighbor, the grounding of dialogue in the scriptures of the two religions, respecting and discussing differences, and honoring awareness of a shared calling and a shared responsibility toward humanity and creation. He states, quote, what we need as a vision for our dialogue is to break the current cycles of violence, to show the world that faith and faith alone can truly ground a commitment to peace, which definitely abandons tempting but lethal cycles of retaliation in which we simply imitate each other's violence. So the common word acknowledges the immense common denominators that the two faiths of Christianity and Islam share by showing that Christ's two great commandments, Christ kind of used an Occam's razor at reducing the Ten Commandments to two, uh, because the, the commandments really are about God and our reverence toward God, but then about our neighbor, our neighbor's goods, our neighbor's wives, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit murder. Those are all love of neighbor. And so Christ reduced these Ten Commandments, which are also found in the Quran, uh, and this is a shared Abrahamic morality, to basically love of God and love of neighbor. These two, according to the common word, are also the two great commandments of the Islamic tradition, uh, to love God and to uh, love one's neighbor. The Prophet Muhammad said, none of you truly believes until he has mercy uh, for others. And one of the companions said, all of us have mercy. He said, I'm not talking about the mercy you show to your friend or your relative. I'm talking about universal mercy, a mercy towards all peoples. And uh, again, the Quran uh, reminds us that um, take care of your neighbor and show goodness to your neighbor, the relative and the distant, which includes, according to all the commentators, peoples of other faith or uh, lack of faith at all. So this is something that we share with also the Jewish tradition, the Shema of the Jewish tradition, which traditionally was recited at least twice a day and, and should be recited at the end of their lives, uh, that in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, as the essence of Abraham's teaching. So this is also, we say it in a different way, which is la ilaha illallah. There's, no, there's nothing worthy of worship except the one true living God, sustainer of all things uh, visible and invisible, creator of the heavens and the earth. So this God, though we differ in our conception uh, of, of uh, certain attributes of the God or the, or the Godhead's nature, uh, nonetheless, it is the same God that we're talking about. Um, 
I think this is important because the Abrahamic family, which is a family, um, and every family has relatives, you know, at, at, at Thanksgiving or Christmas, there's the ones you really don't want to come, but you let them come anyway because they're family. And like Robert Frost said, you know, home is where when you have to go there, they have to let you in. So there are members of the Abrahamic family that aren't always that welcome, but nonetheless, they're part of the family. And uh, I, there's a kind of charity that one shows uh, towards uh, them. Uh, in a letter to the American playwright and diplomat Mordecai Noah, John Adams wrote, this country, America, has done much, meaning to ensure Jewish rights, because that was what the letter was about. I wish it may do more and annul every narrow idea in religion, government, and commerce. It has pleased the providence of the first cause, the universal cause, that Abraham should give religion not only to the Hebrews, but to the Christians and the Mohammedans, the greatest part of the modern civilized world. So I think it's interesting that uh, over 200 years ago, our uh, founding fathers understood that Islam was part of the Abrahamic family, and there's still a lot of people that don't understand that. Um, and uh, Dun Duncan MacDonald, who's very interesting, he, he, was, uh, he was a scholar of Islam, and for people that know the Hartford Seminary, there's the MacDonald Center at the Hartford Seminary. Um, he was, he was a, a very brilliant uh, scholar of Islam. He wrote a book called Islamic Theology, which is surprisingly, after 100 years, still a reasonably good book on the subject. But he said uh, in the introduction to that book, if, as some say, the faith of Muhammad is a cul de sac, it is certainly a very long one. Off it, many courts and doors open, and many peoples are still wander wandering. It is a faith, too, which brings us into touching distance with the great controversies of our own day. We see in it, as in somewhat a distorted mirror, the history of our own past, but we do not yet see its end, even as the end of Christianity is not yet in sight. It is for the student then to remember, Islam is a present reality and the Muslim faith a living organism, a knowledge of whose laws may be of life or death to those of us who are in another camp. For there can be little doubt that the three antagonistic and militant civilizations of the world are those of Christendom, Islam, and China. When these are unified or come to a mutual understanding, then, and only then, will the cause of civilization be secure. He wrote that at the turn of the last century, about 1904, which is quite stunning. So he, uh, I think he preceded Huntington and Bernard Lewis in this idea of the class of civilizations. But he was hopeful, and he was a scholar of Islam, so he was speaking, I think, from a deep uh, knowledge that it is possible for us to reconcile. The thing that we need more than anything else, and it's certainly lacking uh, in large numbers of our species, is just basic intelligence and, 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 and a commitment to learning. Um, ignorance is the enemy. The common word is about trying to eliminate some of the ignorance that's out there. We have to educate ourselves. We owe it to ourselves to know about the great world religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, Judaism. These, are, these influence massive numbers of peoples. And, and it behooves us to really understand just some basic things about these religions. Because one of the things that they all share, which I think is stunningly uh, remarkable, is that they all have an ideal. And when you want to understand a religion, you have to look at what the ideal is. In Christianity, it's imitation of Christ. It's the saintly being. It's the saint. In, in Hinduism, it's, again, somebody, the sunyasi, or somebody who has universal love. In Buddhism, it's, it's the bodhisattva, somebody who foregoes his own enlightenment to work for the enlightenment of others. In, in Judaism, it's the tzaddik. It's the person that strives for righteousness in the world. And in, Christ and in Islam, it's the wali who's hallmarked with universal compassion. The Quran says that Muhammad was only sent وسلم, as a mercy to all the worlds. It doesn't say he was sent as a justice to all the worlds or as a vengeance to all the world. He was sent as a mercy. And those Muslims that don't embody that have abandoned his message. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'm Timothy Shaw, Vice President for Strategy and International Research of the Religious Freedom Institute. It's my pleasure and privilege to moderate our first panel uh, this afternoon uh, as part of the discussion of global declarations on religious freedom and human dignity. Uh, we have three outstanding panelists, and I'll ask, I'll ask them to come forward now. That is uh, Knox Thames, uh, uh, Kishan Manocha, and David Anderson. We're going to discuss three remarkable, uh, beautiful, powerful declarations on religious freedom and human dignity. The Potomac Declaration, which we'll discuss first, uh, thanks to my friend Knox Thames. We'll then discuss the Beirut Declaration on Faith for Rights. Uh, Kishan Minocha, who was directly involved in uh, the uh, process for bringing that about, will uh, speak. Uh, and then uh, parliamentarian from Canada, David Anderson, uh, whom we welcome uh, here at Washington, will discuss the Oslo Charter for Freedom of Religion uh, or Belief. We really cannot uh, overstate the significance of these documents. They are beautiful documents. They're substantive documents. They uh, belie and uh, they deny an easy cultural relativism that is now common, a common cynicism, that it is not possible to build robust conceptual barriers around principles of religious freedom uh, and dignity today. Uh, they oppose, uh, they refute uh, an easy cynicism and skepticism uh, that says our religious, cultural, philosophical differences make it impossible uh, for us to have consensus uh, and common ground and coalition around these principles. And indeed, these charters, these uh, documents are a reminder of the very powerful claim that Aristotle made uh, hundreds of years ago. I'm in the presence of my friend Tom Hibbs, philosopher, uh, so I feel compelled to quote Aristotle. Uh, 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 Tom is about to become, has just become president of the University of Dallas. Uh, and so let me uh, quote Aristotle, who said that what's most distinctive about our humanity, uh, what makes it uh, true that we are political animals, is our capacity uh, for speech about the just and the unjust, the expedient uh, and the inexpedient. We're not like the other animals who make sounds uh, expressing pain and pleasure, uh, but we're actually capable of expressing uh, shared concepts, intelligible notions of the just uh, and the unjust. And these declarations, these powerful declarations, are a reminder of our shared humanity, our ability to articulate a common word uh, concerning the just and the unjust, freedom uh, and unfreedom uh, and dignity and oppression. Uh, and so we are delighted that we have uh, three uh, impressive, uh, experienced, knowledgeable uh, advocates uh, of uh, religious freedom, experts on uh, religious freedom. We will first hear uh, from my dear friend and colleague, Knox Thames, uh, who has to leave rather uh, shortly because he's heavily involved in the second annual ministerial uh, to advance religious freedom. We're delighted that he was able to, to be here. I'll just say brief, briefly that Knox serves as the special advisor for religious minorities in the Near East and South Central Asia at the U.S. Department of State here in Washington. He is the first person to serve in this capacity. He received a civil service appointment in September 2015 and leads State Department efforts to address the situation of religious minorities in these regions, in the Near East and South and Central Asia. For over a decade and a half, Knox has worked in various U.S. government capacities, including at two different U.S. government foreign policy commissions, and he is an expert on a range of international affairs issues, including human rights, religious freedom, counter-extremism, and international organizations. His country expertise covers the Middle East and South and Central Asia. Before joining the State Department, he was the Director of Policy and Research at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. We'll then hear from Kishan Manocha, who is Senior Advisor on Freedom of Religion or Belief at the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. Dr. Manocha has extensive experience in religious freedom issues in Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, and Central and South Asia as an advocate, researcher, trainer, and consultant to a number of international and non-governmental organizations. He's been senior advisor on freedom of religion or belief at the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights in Warsaw since May 2015. 
Prior to that, he served as director of the Office of Public Affairs of the Baha'i Community of the United Kingdom. And then uh, we'll hear from David Anderson, who is the member of parliament for the Saskatchewan riding of Cypress Hills Grasslands. He was first elected in 2000 and has subsequently been re-elected five times. He has served as parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources and for the Canadian Wheat Board and parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Consular. He currently serves as shadow cabinet secretary for human rights and religious freedom. He's been committed to raising awareness of the need to protect religious freedom long before it was fashionable. Uh, he has been hosting parliamentary forums on religious freedom and he worked to pass motion 382 which unanimously declared the Parliament of Canada's support for religious freedom around the world. And he's a founding member of the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief. So we'll first uh, begin with uh, Knox Thames. We'll speak about the Potomac Declaration, uh, which was issued last year uh, at the conclusion of the first annual ministerial to advance religious freedom. Uh, we'll then hear from Kishan Minocha, who will talk about the Beirut Declaration on Faith for Rights. And then finally, David Anderson, who will speak about the Oslo Charter for Freedom of Religion or Belief. I've asked uh, these distinguished panelists to speak to two particular issues. First, I'd like them to say a bit about what's distinctive about each of these remarkable documents, and then say a little bit about the impact uh, that each of these documents has had, and of course, uh, any other issues that they would like to address. So we'll begin with you, uh, Knox. There we go. All right. Well, it's great to be here. <laughs> uh, especially, to hear you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's great to be heard. Um, I want to thank RFI for inviting me to speak on this panel. Uh, Tim is one of the foremost experts in the world on religious freedom, particularly in India and South Asia. Um, RFI, uh, thanks to Tom's leadership, has really become a, a juggernaut in this area. <laughs> and truth be told, as someone who was designing the ministerial, we very easily could have made this an RFI ministerial because they've got uh, a real impressive stable of experts. It's also great to be on a panel with my friend David Anderson, who I had partnered with in at USURF, to, um, he took a leading role in creating the International Panel of Parliamentarians, and of course with Kishan, who's uh, heading up the religious freedom work at the OSCE. Um, I will have to explain the declaration and then leave, because we've got a lot of balls in the air today, as you might imagine. Um, but the, the Potomac Declaration was, uh, our, uh, our, our desire was to have the United States clearly state its commitment to uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights definition of freedom of religion or belief as defined by Article 18. Uh, last year was the 70th anniversary of the UDHR, so we wanted to ground the entire framework of the ministerial in this uh, common statement and explanation of religious freedom. Because while we have the First Amendment here in the United States, which has been a wonderful uh, framework that has ensured tremendous religious liberty at an unprecedented level. Um, it is unique to our experience, and it's the the way the UDHR framed it is one that's common to all of our uh, different countries and backgrounds. So we wanted to ground it in that. We I want to read a few passages from it um, that I think are worth highlighting. Uh, the Declaration highlights that the freedom to seek the divine and act accordingly, including the right of an individual to act consistently with his or her conscience is at the heart of the human experience. Governments cannot take it away. Rather, every nation shares the solemn responsibility to defend and protect religious freedom. But we're far from the ideals declared in the Universal Declaration 70 years ago. And then the Declaration states, defending religious freedom is the collective responsibility of the global community. It is a responsibility of all countries to come together to protect the free exercise of religion 
And when we see that happening, we see a decrease in other social ills such as instability, conflict, and terrorism. It also highlights how it is a social good, religious freedom, and that it enables um, other positives such as uh, enabling people of faith to actively engage their societies through, through good works. Um, it states clearly that a, pers a person's conscience is inviolable, that all persons are equal based in their shared humanity, that coercion aimed at forcing a person to adopt a certain religion is inconsistent with religious freedom. And uh, something that Tom and I have talked a lot about, it highlights that persons who belong to faith communities and non-believers alike have a right to participate freely in the public discourse of the respective societies, that they are equal participants in the civic space. Now what I think sets the Declaration apart was that really it had two components. We had the Potomac Declaration, but then we also had the Potomac Plan of Action. So while we were restating international commitments, declaring the United States fidelity to that, we also knew that there's a lot of things that need to happen. Um, so with it, we also issued the Potomac Plan of Action that set out seven different chapters, seven different topical areas of activity that, that we have then, over the past year, been trying to channel activities to, through, and forward from. We've had some success in pushing the conversation forward. Uh, the first section heading was defending the human right of religious freedom or belief. We were able to have the government of Taiwan host in Taipei a special NGO summit for Southeast Asia to train activists in how do you promote religious freedom in the context of China, which is incredibly difficult, but also in other contexts in Southeast Asia. Uh, another, another component was education, the right, the need to teach children the value of interfaith understanding and the benefits of diversity. We were able to partner with the United Arab Emirates and in February have a regional follow-up conference in Abu Dhabi where we try to answer that question. Um, and we'll be having a breakout session on Wednesday uh, that I will chair with our Emirati friends to continue that conversation so that it wasn't just a one-off. Um, we had a, um, a section on responding to uh, genocide and mass atrocities. So we've um, been looking to have uh, conversations um, with the United Kingdom where we convened with them at Wilton Park a special discussion on what state steps can the international community take to preserve, um, to re rather reconstruct an environment where religious minorities feel like they have a future. What, how do we do humanitarian aid better to have a higher sensitivity to the unique needs of religious minorities in a conflict zone? Um, and then we had one on cultural heritage and I'm uh, there will be a country announcing on Thursday that they'll have a follow-up conference in the coming weeks focused on preserving the cultural heritage of religious communities. Um, you know, when we're looking to re-establish um, my, minority life in a place like Iraq, of course it's water, electricity, and security, but we also saw that when ISIS was committing a genocide against people, they were also committing a cultural genocide. And so we've seen that rebuilding uh, helping communities rebuild their religious life is going to be a key part in that solution set. Um, and then lastly, we highlighted uh, the need to establish an international day to remember the victims of persecution. And Yulina here was uh, one of the uh, lead proponents of that idea that we borrowed from her, we put in the plan of action, and then the government of Poland took up. And about a month ago, I guess it was, six weeks ago, in May, um, they were able to move through the General Assembly, a special resolution to establish August 22nd as the International Day to remember the victims of persecution and to also challenge all of us to do more to promote religious freedom. Um, so these are positives. These are things where we use the Declaration to set the ideal out and then the plan of action to put forward ideas. Uh, we hope to further expand the plan of action after the ministerial to put in some new components from the discussions that we've been having. Um, and I'll just end with this. It's, while it's a statement of the United States, we didn't negotiate this with other partners. Um, we thought uh, it would be a way to put out ideas that all of us, government, civil society actors, religious communities, could focus on, could put our uh, common efforts toward, and try to uh, expand space for freedom of conscience, freedom of belief around the world. So I'm sorry I can't say any longer. I've got to run to another event. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I'm sure you'll have a fascinating discussion and maybe even better once I'm gone. No, no. So, <laughs> thank so, you, Knox. Thank you let's, let's, let's appreciate Knox. Uh.
Knock them dead, Knox. Uh, we wish you the best as the ministerial gets underway. Uh, I should have said, and, and we'll just say briefly now, that all of the declarations we're discussing in this panel are, in a sense, governmental. Uh, the Potomac Declaration that Knox just discussed, along with the Potomac Plan of Action, represents an initiative of the United States government, uh, and several other governments have joined uh, that uh, U.S.-led uh, effort. Uh, Kishan Minocha will speak about another uh, different kind of governmental uh, effort, uh, in this case the Beirut Declaration on Faith for Rights, which really in part reflects leadership of, of the United Nations, of course an inter intergovernmental uh, body, but also uh, a remarkable degree of partnership between United Nations agencies and uh, faith-based uh, uh, actors. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Minocha, thanks very much for joining us, and we look forward to your remarks about the Beirut Declaration on Faith for Rights. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Tim, and I'm um, <laughs> delighted to be here. I'm very grateful to this invitation from RFI and ICLOS. Um, I heard the Ambassador Brownback say that he got up at 4 o'clock with a great sense of anticipation and excitement. I got up at 3.30 uh, because of jet lag, <laughs> uh, which will explain why this might be slightly, if it isn't coherent, I apologize, and I blame on the jet lag rather than on my, uh, my capacity to explain this uh, uh, very interesting and um, quite far-reaching uh, declaration. Uh, the first thing I would say is that, well, I would like to address why the need in the first place to have yet another declaration. Why the need for more words? Then to say something about the main uh, features, the distinguishing features, principles, and then something around, if there's time, uh, what we're learning about, um, I wouldn't say implementing it, but the uh, experience of raising awareness, of trying to translate the ideals into some tangible reality and the impact uh, that this has been having around the world. And I guess to say that why the need is to say a little bit about why I thought it was a good thing to uh, sign on to and to contribute to. And I would say first of all that there was a feeling among a number of people over a long time that we need to do something to dispel this false dichotomy between faith and human rights. We could spend not just the rest of the afternoon, but probably a whole week, if not longer, discussing this, and I won't do that. But I will say that clearly, from the nods around the room, there's a, a degree of uh, recognition that this dichotomy is, uh, is most unfortunate and has paralyzed many efforts to bring um, religious freedom, freedom of belief, as we, we often say in Europe, or we do say in Europe, uh, to the fore and to build sustainable action to, it, to advance it and other human rights. Secondly, we couldn't escape acknowledging that, sadly, uh, and I think this is where the, the, the faith or rights discussions were very helpful and honest because there was an acknowledgement that there has been, sadly, a contribution on the part of religious actors, faith actors, however you want to define them or call them, to the challenging human rights situation around the world, the deteriorating human rights situation around the world, because sometimes acts of violence, infringements of human rights, incitement to violent discrimination on grounds of religion and belief are, um, if not perpetrated, but condoned in the name of religion or faith. Thirdly, to say there have been, this will surprise people, a number of initiatives over many years to reclaim the shared space between religion, or faith, and human rights. Some of them have been initiated by the United Nations, but there was a sense that they haven't reached their goal. They have fallen short. There is a leadership gap, a leadership gap on the part of faith communities, religious communities, belief communities, um, to honestly take this issue of, of advancing human rights for all, of promoting and advancing the concept of and the reality of human dignity for all, there's, a, there's been a gap here. A gap on the part of individuals, but also on the part of coalitions of individuals and of communities 
etc., etc., um, and to do this in a sustainable way, and to not just talk about it, but actually to realize action on the ground. So these are some of the drivers. And so to address this, um, a group of individuals representing faith communities, or not representing faith communities and traditions, I should say, more importantly, human rights uh, experts in the academy, uh, and civil society activists working on human rights issues, working on tolerance and non-discrimination agendas, uh, came together to adopt this declaration that took the name after the city in which it was launched, Beirut. However, to give it its correct title, it is the Beirut Declaration on Faith Rights and its 18 commitments. 18, um, it's uh, not coincidental, is of course named after Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and International Civil and Political, uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But this declaration goes beyond freedom of religion or belief, religious freedom. It's about the whole array of human rights. So the faith rights framework given birth two marches ago, March 2017 in Beirut, under the auspices of the United Nations to address this leadership gap, but also to say something um, and not to provide the language to address the, the, the shared space between faith and human rights, but also to give birth to, to inspire a range of actions, of practical tools, of initiatives that could be taken forward within the framework of faith for rights. To raise a call to all believers, however they define themselves, theistic, atheistic, non-theistic, to take a stand, to stand up, for faith and human rights, but then to translate this into sustainable reality. So it's a declaration that seeks to not just talk about, but actually to practically advance common ground. There was another point that was felt very strongly by those who, uh, if you like, signed up in the first instance to this declaration. It was to say also that while we attach great value to initiatives of interfaith and interreligious dialogue over many, many years. They themselves have, if you like, borne witness to what the different faith traditions share. However, they haven't gone perhaps far enough. And the people making this claim are not people who've sat on the sidelines, people who have sort of looked at these things in a very detached fashion. They've been very much at the heart of these initiatives in many countries all over the world to say there's this um, sadly uh, lack, if you like, of a, a signing up to a common minimum standard. The words have been expressed, the wonderful thoughts have been expressed, the aspirations have been expressed when it comes to faith and human rights. But what is lacking is some sort of common minimum international standard. To set a standard and to invite others to come on board, knowing that some will not want to come on board, some way find this to be too aspirational, too unrealistic, and challenging from within their own faith or non-faith traditions. But that's part of the discussion, that's part of the process. To welcome those uh, reflections, to welcome those challenges, to welcome that dissent, if you like, from within and among the different faith traditions. So interfaith dialogue then seen very much as an important key to unlock the action that should follow. Just want to briefly uh, just say something about some of the other distinguishing features. Mention the common ground. This is not a declaration that seeks to gloss over uh, nor to uh, become paralyzed by theological and doctrinal divides. It acknowledges that differences do exist. We, the document seeks to not um, go down and uh, engage with that but to favor the identification of common ground and to build consensus of where the different faiths and beliefs come together as one to uphold human dignity, human rights, including freedom, religion, or belief for all. As I said, it is action-oriented. It's designed to invite all believers, including non-believers, who share the objectives to take practical actions. It's deliberately, it's intended to be inclusive so when the term faith actor is used, 
it includes religious leaders, it includes individuals of faith, whether they hold a prominent or not so prominent position in their communities, but they are inspired and shaped by their faith to take action for the good of all. It includes organizations that identify themselves as faith-based or faith-inspired organizations. So that's faith actors, but also a more broad array of civil society actors as well, inclusive of them. It also explicitly recognizes, and you see this throughout the Declaration, the indivisibility and interdependence of all human rights. So yes, four figures, or just freedom from figures prominently, but we're not going to detach that from gender equality or freedom of expression or non-discrimination. There's a call for everyone who wants to sign up to this and who's committed to it to be introspective. Yes, to act with integrity, but to think and reflect very, very deeply about how their traditions, uh, their respect to traditions empowers them to respect and to advance human dignity and human rights, but also how they see it as perhaps sometimes hindering them from doing so. Introspection. Another theme that runs throughout is responsibility. And you can look at this in many different ways. And I won't uh, steal the thunder, steal the, the impact the document will hopefully have on you by, by listing all the times it, it refers to responsibility. But one of the responsibilities is that of interpretation. So it's an invitation for an engagement with texts and with traditions in ways that serve the best interests of, of humanity. And that's framed as a responsibility to all believers and not just to leaders or those who hold um, prominent positions in, in those traditions or communities. And it makes the point that the responsibility of individual actors and of faith leaders, religious leaders, is not just one that has its source in religious teachings and precepts, but also one that the international legal framework also mandates. And there are references to where uh, that is, is, uh, is made, where, that's, where those uh, sentiments, if you like, that call is expressed. There are 18 commitments. I'm not sure we have time to, to even list some of them, some of the, the, the ones that really stand out. I'll leave them to you to, uh, to, to, to discover if you haven't discovered them already. I've said this is more than just, in a way, a declaration. Um, it's very interesting that the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, Ahmad Shahid, who will be here this week, has in a number of his reports to the General Assembly and to the Human Rights Council cited uh, the Faith and Rights Framework as a soft law standard. Most recently in his report on, uh, to the Human Rights Council on Freedom of Religion and Belief and Freedom of Expression. Um, but also, it's been very encouraging to see in the last few years the array of initiatives that the Faith and Rights Framework has given birth to, whether it be um, short films of individuals of faith, religious leaders speaking about what human rights mean to them, whether it be uh, in the convening of a small uh, local level multi-faith roundtables or spaces to talk about faith and human rights and to promote and advance them and to seek to safeguard them, including FORB for all. Um, and we can talk a bit more about how those initiatives have uh, come about um, and, and how we wish to obviously sustain them. I think just the last point to say about challenges to implementation, if you like, uh, are around how do you make people aware of this? Um, notwithstanding the prevalence of social digital media, uh, and all that does to, to seek and raise awareness. But how do, nevertheless, we bring the message to those who really need to know about it at the very local grassroots levels? Yes, we do need then to think about how you engage those in positions of leadership who can uh, cascade the message down and give it its, their stamp of approval. But also to say, well, in situations where that may not be forthcoming, we don't give up. We look at the ways in which to access those in our communities, those in our lives, those among our networks. So everyone who is signed up is required or is certainly challenged and invited to think about how they will take 
actions to simply raise awareness. I think the other point to make when we look at coalitions that seek particularly to advance freedom, religion or belief for all is to think of the, the people who are never in the room, the people who sometimes we feel, well, they could provoke an argument, things could get a bit heated. Well, that's one of the things we hope the Faithful Rights Framework will actually do, not to deliberately provoke arguments, but if they do come, if the dissent does appear, to engage constructively, to engage openly and honestly. That's part of the dialogue. It also, of course, then leads to a need, and the need is to have more cross-disciplinary uh, reflection on questions of faith and, and rights, which is one of the things that the framework envisages. But also to think about the ways in which issues of human dignity, human rights, freedom, religion, belief can be made relevant, mainstreamed, to the real needs and concerns of individuals, of groups, and of communities. So we think about climate change, we think of poverty eradication, we think of women's rights, for example, we think of a whole range of things where often freedom, religion, or belief, other human rights may not figure so prominently. Once those issues are seen relevant to those, say, who are uh, advancing a whole array of objectives, then we're likely to be part of this broader coalition to advance FORB and other human rights. So we're finding that the Faith of Alliance framework finds itself um, landing in a number of spaces, including within the overall framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. So those are some of the issues that are, I think, are ahead of us as we seek to extend the scope of this, uh, if you like, of this declaration and of its uh, framework in all parts of the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Minoch. It's, uh, yes, let's uh, express our appreciation. Um, it's remarkable, among other things, that the Beirut Declaration includes an, a process of ongoing action. For example, annual uh, uh, walks of faith uh, every December 10th to mark the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other uh, frameworks and, and, and strategies that sustain action uh, 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 in, into the future. Uh, now I'm delighted that our um, 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 friend from Canada, the Right Honorable uh, David Anderson, uh, my friend, uh, uh, member of parliament from Saskatchewan, uh, very active uh, and, and currently uh, a founding member and chair of the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief. We'll talk about the Oslo Charter for Freedom of Religion or Belief, which is interestingly conjoined with another governmental initiative of a sort, the International Panel uh, of Parliamentari uh, Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief. Uh, Mr. Anderson, great to have you with us. So we talked a little bit earlier about uh, making words out of acronyms or whatever. I guess uh, IPP Forb could be a word. I just don't know what it would mean. <laughs> uh, we've been told it's probably the worst acronym in, in the history. But anyway, it stands for the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion and Belief. Uh, it came out of a meeting that uh, was first held in Oxford in the summer of 2014 when a group of uh, us found ourselves at a uh, conference on religious freedom. It was hosted by the uh, all-party uh, group in England, the Brigham Young University, and the United States Commission were responsible for bringing us together. We sat down together as, and there was a group of parliamentarians, about 10 of us, and just decided uh, we need to talk about whether there's something we can do for parliamentarians to support them. And uh, out of that came a, a discussion that we thought, yes, we can do something. And what is it that we should do? Should we put together a, like an NGO-style organization? Do we put together some sort of an agency? What is it that would work best uh, when we're thinking in global terms? And the notion was that the best thing for us would be to set up some sort of an informal network where we could support each other uh, of those colleagues who were interested in the issues of religious freedom. We made a decision to move ahead. Uh, we met again back in Oslo in, uh, in November 8th, 2014. My friend Abed Raja, who's part of our steering group, invited us to come. And we signed on to the Oslo Charter in, in Oslo at the Nobel Peace Prize uh, uh, Institute. The uh, group included parliamentarians from 30 countries. And I just looked here, it's South America, North America, Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and Europe were all represented in that group. So this is about four months after we came together and, uh, and that group was put together. Now it was a group of a very different um, people from very different backgrounds. So we had a broad-based, multi-faith, multi-partisan project. And I guess the question was, what is it that we're going to focus on? How do we, how do we find common ground? And as Ambassador Brownback mentioned, uh, what is this odd coalition that we're going to try to put together? 
And so out of that, uh, I think we started looking around, what is it that we could, we could really find as a base? And uh, the beginning of the preamble of the United Nations Declaration states that whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, then Article 1 says, human all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason, conscience, and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. I guess there we find both the benefits and the responsibilities of being humans and, be and belonging to this family. And then in Article 18, of course, was the focus on those human rights that we find around religious freedom. The Oslo Charter itself is a pretty short document. I'm not going to go through it. It has four whereases. And so the, it just touches on there are severe violations of freedom of religion. There is an increase in restrictions around the world uh, on the practice of religion or belief. And with the majority of the population of the earth being under some sort of restriction, uh, increasing numbers of governments and organizations are paying attention to this issue. And the freedom of thought, conscience, religions is a universal established uh, right and non-derogable non, uh, non human right. So those were the whereases. There was one, call it reaffirmation, but I said one affirmation, and that would be of Article 18. So the notion of the three principles, you have the right to believe, you have the right to change your belief, and you have the right to practice your belief. And then towards the end of it, there was just a, uh, a uh, commitment to, get this here, uh, to three, three commitments. One is to promote, and this, the, promote freedom of religion or belief for all persons through our work and, and institutions to enhance global cooperation by endeavoring, endeavoring to work across geographical, political, and religious lines and undertake efforts to jointly promote freedom of religion or belief, share information, and mobily effect, uh, uh, mobilize effective responses. I think the unique part of this is that we actually require each of the members or each of the participants of the network to actually subscribe to this. And so that, that limits us in some ways. We're happy to have that very narrow focus and we've worked hard to maintain it because there are obviously many directions that we could go on many different issues, but we have made a decision, a conscious decision that IPP4 will focus primarily solely on Article 18 and trying to generate that capacity and that opportunity for everybody that we find uh, around the globe. Um, it requires that, that, um, that commitment from each of, our, each of our participants. We have a lot of different uh, perspectives coming in, obviously. Even at our initial meeting, it was interesting because we had people right from one end of the political spectrum to the other, right at, across a whole number of religious faith groups, and yet this is the place that we've been able to find the common ground, and I think it's the place where it has enabled us to move ahead to the point now, I've mentioned this before, but we have approximately 300 legislators around the globe now who are part of our network interested in being part of it and from about 70 different countries. So we're hoping to, uh, to have an you know, ever-increasing impact. Uh, we believe it's important from our position as elected officials to, uh, that we reach out to others because I think we have a unique opportunity, we have been given a unique position, and we have a unique responsibility to try to enhance and support the, the basic human rights that people have. Um, that's not the only document that uh, IPP Forb has put out. We find at each of our meetings in New York in, in 2015, uh, we put out a document there as well. We have found uh, strength in advocacy letters. I mention this everywhere that I go. What our, our um, program is, is that when we send out, send out an advocacy letter, we don't send 15 of them from Canada to, the, to one embassy in Ottawa. What we do is we ask our members around the world, would you take this letter and if you possibly can, would you send it to your, your embassy for this country locally? Because those ambassadors all have to report back to their home country. And if they get 45 letters on one subject from 45 different countries, it, it, we have been told that that actually has made an impact in policy decisions and declarations that have been made in countries. So that's just a small thing. Um, our focus is on letting local groups, local legislators develop their FORB group. And then we try to come to them and say, is there something that we can help you with? And we, we want to work with you. So if you can set up a local, national one, and then set up a regional one, that's even better, and we will try to work with you. And that is the, the core, I guess the Oslo Charter is the core of what we're doing. It is the declaration that each of our uh, participants needs to adhere to. And I can tell you, we have had people who have left our meetings and have not come back because uh, they have been told this is what we believe and we are not compromising on any one of those three things. So if you can't support all three of them, you probably need to find a different place to do your work. So uh, we're not trying to be exclusive, but we do believe that this is a, an inalienable human right and uh, people have the right to, uh, to participate fully uh, 
in what they believe and to practice that. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Thank you.